Ellen, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Noel. So this book is very interesting in terms of, uh, I mean, one, your own journey, your own story. How did this book come about? So, yeah, since you mentioned it, I'll go into that a little bit. So I um, have worked for the Washington Post for a long time, 16 years, yeah. um, and they created this new beat to cover weddings, um, and I decided to apply for the beat, and the day that I got the beat, um, when I was 30 years old, I went through a breakup with my longtime boyfriend. Like, the thing, the two things happened within hours of each other. It was this <laughs> epic sort of, you know, terrible chick flick, you know, I felt like I was just trapped in, yeah. a, in a bad movie. Um, and uh, I didn't know what was going to happen to me, what it was going to be like to sort of spend all of my days and professional hours talking to these happy couples on their way down the aisle while I, you know, hid in the bathroom, <laughs> <laughs> trying not to let my coworkers see me cry. Um, but what ended up happening was that all of the people I met, hundreds and hundreds of couples, some who were, a lot of who were um, getting ready to get married, and then many, many of whom had been married for decades, um, as well as experts on relationships, they all ended up becoming my personal guides and gurus. And they really um, altered my life and my course because of the wisdom that they shared with me and, and the way that um, I applied that to my life. And, um, you know, along the way, I covered um, relationships for five years. And along the way, I, you know, grieved and started dating again. And then uh, eventually sort of met the right guy and uh, moved in and got married and had, as you said, a couple of kids. So, wow. um, yeah. And, you know, I, I might have I might have missed him. Yeah. to be honest with you. And so I really um, felt that I owed these people um, the gift of passing along what I had been given. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why I, I felt like I had to write the book. You know, as you're sharing this, it all, I get this visual of like this ancient road that many have traveled. And like you have this bird's eye view of watching all these people trying to travel this ancient road and take the wisdom of what they're saying and apply it to relationship. And I, the question I had, you know, it seems like it's pretty common these days that where couples, they tend to check out of relationship when it gets tough. Mm -hmm. And what did you learn about commitment and marriage from all the couples that you spoke with? Okay. I'm so glad you asked. This is one of my big topics in the book and just in life that I uh, feel like we need to talk so much more about. Um, you know, one of the marriage experts that I sat down with pretty early on um, in in my course of covering relationships um, talked to me a lot about expectation setting. And she talked about how there are these really sort of well-established points in the course of a relationship that are going to be difficult, right? So she w would say, listen, when you first move in together, it's going to be hard. When you have young children at home, it's going to be hard. When you have teenagers at home, it's going to be very difficult, right? And so guess what? When you sort of know that and know that it's par for the course, it's so much easier to say, oh, this is just normal and this is what everybody goes through rather than saying, oh my gosh, we're, we're, we're not doing well. We, I must have married the wrong guy. I must have married the wrong girl. I better get out of this, go find the right girl the yeah. right guy, and then what ends up happening is you sort of hit those bumps in a road in the beginning and say, oh, well, that wasn't the right one either, you know, better go <laughs> find the right one again. And so um, I think just having that perspective has helped me uh, so much so that when my husband and I do sort of hit um, these, these hard points in life, you know, we can sort of rely on that knowledge of, okay, you know, people don't always talk about this and I wish that they did and I wish we were sort of more open um, about how challenging marriage can be. They're not, but just having the knowledge that everybody else in the world is going through this and it's our job to make it through this mm. uh, has helped just, just so much. And so, um, you know, I just, I, I love what you guys are doing and I love your mission because I just am so excited for people to have any resources that they can to sort of help them understand um, how to navigate marriage yeah. because yeah. it is challenging. It is. It is. And it's interesting because I think a lot of people think they don't have this concept of that marriage can be 
difficult. I mean, and I like to say that it's like taking Cinderella and Huck Finn and throwing them in a submarine and you wonder why, you know, and submerging them under for a, a, a period of time, you wonder why there is those challenges, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. inevitable, but I think it's what you do. It's how do you respond to those challenges, those difficult moments, those spots where you're just like, wow, this is, I didn't think it was going to be this tough right. um, that ultimately right. will right. determine the outcome of where you go. Right. Right. And so yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe based on your interviews, I, I just love that you have all these stories. So I want to like I want to bring that to the surface here. What are some of the stories you can share with our audience about making marriage last? Sure. OK, so let me tell you about one of my favorite couples, um, Betty and Edgar. Uh, it was their name. And they I walked in. So I'm um, five eight and I was wearing heels and I walked into their house. This is a couple who'd been married for 60 plus years. Um, they were both like barely came up to my elbows. They had matching canes that they kind of tottered around with and they looked up at me like they'd never seen such a giant person. And so we went back into their living room, which was, you know, piled high with stacks of New Yorker magazines. And, um, you know, I just sat down with them for a number of hours and heard their story. And um, I asked a couple of questions at the end of it. My first one was, what do you think about this idea that a lot of us um, in my generation have today about um, there being the one, right? And Betty looked at me I, like I had two heads, right? She said, you people are so crazy today. If I hadn't been married to Edgar for 65 years, I would have been married to somebody else for 65 years. And her point was, it's not about her and it wasn't about that particular person it was about the commitment and the level of commitment that they made to each other I think that that's um, really crucial and it speaks to your earlier point that that it is about sort of how we respond so I said okay well how do you do this how do you you know make it to 65 years with somebody and her answer was so simple and yet so challenging um, to put into practice and it was be nice be nice. You know, I mean, it's the first thing that we're taught in kindergarten and in school. Um, and it's so easy to be nice to waiters and waitresses and checkout clerks and people in the elevator. And it can be so challenging to be nice to your spouse. Um, but there is really good evidence um, and scientific research that's been done that says the little touch on the small of the back, um, the clearing of a plate, all of these tiny things that we do in our day-to-day -day marriage add up to so much more that a bouquet of flowers ever can. Mm -hmm. And so I think sort of having that at the top of our mind every day, how can I just be nice to this person and not treat them like wallpaper, just treat them like something I don't even see anymore, but to sort of really see them and to approach um, my marriage and my spouse with kindness. That's something that's always stayed with me. Hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting because you reference research and I don't know if you're familiar with Shanti Feldhan. Um, yeah. Yeah. So she's a researcher and she's kind of combined her research with marriage and she wrote a book and I interviewed her a while back on the secrets to successfully happy marriages and her whole premise it's mm -hmm. kind of shocking because she thought, oh, you got to marry the right person. It's got to be, you know, you have to come from an intact family to make sure that this thing's going to work out. And all those um, hypotheses really didn't prove to be the lasting effect of how, how happy a couple is going to be. It came mm -hmm. down to what you're saying. And that's the daily little things that we're doing over and right. over again. That's right. actually what determined highly happy marriages versus those that were struggling. So... Um, right. When you say be nice, though, I, I always think of the couple who maybe is in that place. Uh, maybe you have a story to relate to this, um, that, you know, there's there's stuff that they brought into the relationship that was challenging. And it's I guess you could, for lack of a better term, baggage yeah. that they're bringing. And it's somewhat challenges the be nice you know, because of that, I don't know if you, did you interview any couples that kind of journeyed into that space with how, how do you recover the heart of your spouse in the midst of some of the stuff that you're maybe bringing into it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's a um, great question. And, you know, I interviewed a lot of people who had um, been through divorces, some of the, whom were um, marrying again, and mm -hmm. some of whom just sort of, um, you know, on the other side of it, looking back. And, um, I would say a couple of things. One woman who I'll just never forget. She was a mother of four. 
Um, her husband had filed for divorce, um, totally unbeknownst to her. She she was served papers and you know just had while she was cooking dinner had no idea it was coming. Um, and what she told me was, "Don't turn away from it, right?" When you feel yourself um, having trouble, um, not being nice, um, dealing with your own stuff and taking it out on your spouse, um, don't run away, right? Uh, don't go into the other room for the next five days um, or five years, as some people do. Don't hide at work. Don't hide, you know, with your bottle of Budweiser or your tub of ice cream or with you know, your iPhone, which is what most of us do these days, um, you have to address it. And that um, is also sort of what, what most experts would say, you know, wh when we find ourselves uh, averting our eyes and not looking at the dark places and not um, trying to grapple with it, um, that's when we're really in trouble. And I think it's okay, I think, you know, we have this, and, and I'm um, such a prime example of this, I'm a really conflict-averse person, I hate fighting, um, and I think fighting, uh, is particularly at the beginning of my relationship, I was just so scared of it. Um, Luckily, I married a guy who was much more comfortable, came from a much sort of louder um, family that's, uh, you know, more used to sort of arguments, and it didn't um, raise his blood pressure the way it did mine. But as I sort of got into the research, I found that I really needed to develop my um, skills around conflict um, because if I just fear it and think that every time we fight, it's going to be mean the end of it, um, that I'm really doing us a disservice, and and that running away from it probably will be the thing that um, you know spells the end of it. And so I think sort of changing the way we look at conflict and our ability to relate to each other, and and making conflict okay. You know, saying, listen, um, as one uh, marriage expert put it to me, she said, the sound of a couple fighting should remind you of the sound of a train moving along the tracks, right? Da -da 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 -da. When you don't hear that sound, it means the train has stopped. It means you're not bothering to even work on it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if we can sort of shift our perspective on a couple of things and say, listen, I have my stuff, you have your stuff, everybody in the world has their stuff, we're choosing to be in it together, let's do the best we can, let's not turn away from it, and let's do the work. Yeah, yeah. yeah so good. Tell me, uh, of all the interviews that you did, what was the most memorable? Oh, gosh. That's yeah, uh, a tough one, but I'm going I'm to put it out there. It's like choosing between children, right? I mean, <laughs> there are some <laughs> that were memorable because they were just kind of so crazy. You know, I had this one couple, they were very sort of new agey, and they both um, would tell you that they had reached full consciousness in life. And so he saw himself as the entire, you know, full embodiment of God, as did she. <laughs> Wow. So when they were together, they, they had were deity wars. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so, you know, I had just watched, you know, and two sort of Wiccan people who got together and they were sort of nuts out. But, you know, the couples that um, touched me the most, there, were, there was one couple who, um, it was a, a, a couple who met in the service and their names were Bob and Henry and they met during World War II and they ended up um, marrying when they were both in their 80s after many, many, many decades together and of course most of those decades sort of hiding their relationship and their um, love but you know they said something similar to me when I asked them how did you keep it together and and you know Bob said uh, be polite essentially you know excuse me thank you God bless you those little things day in and day out that makes you, you still feel like a human and again not just you know a piece of furniture. Hmm. Interesting. So for the listeners who are still dating, quickly, what are your top lessons? I think you probably explored a lot of that in your journey of interviews. <laughs> and journey of life. <laughs> yeah, that too. Uh, <laughs> mostly through my many mistakes. Um, you know, my big one is you, you have to sort of lose your expectations of, of what it is um, that you need to have in the person that you're going to marry. So um, I, the, the couple that told it best to me was a woman who was, she was this Jewish girl, she always thought she'd marry a Jewish boy, and she ended up falling for an Indian guy, Indian American. 
and he broke up with her a few minutes, a few months after dating. Um, said, I have to marry somebody, you know, who's either from India or of Indian descent. And she was heartbroken. And she then met his mother, who was a Caucasian, and she couldn't wrap her head around it. Mm. Um, and so they were apart for a long, long time and then finally got back together, interestingly enough, on a business school trip to India where he said, realized, you know, she was the one he was meant to be with. And I said, well, what about you? Wasn't it hard for you to kind of get over the fact that he wasn't Jewish? He wasn't what you had always imagined? And she said, no, because um, a friend had once told her it will never come in the package you're expecting. It'll never come in the package you're expecting. And uh, that has proven to be true time and time again with so many couples that I interviewed. You know, one woman, this African-American woman, super professional, had owned her own house. She had one expectation for the person she was going to marry. He had to reach the high things on the shelf. She, she ended up with a little person. I mean, like, a little person, right? And she said, that's how I knew I really loved him. And so if I could talk to any single person, I'd just say lose all the superficial stuff so that you can see each person for who they really are um, because I think it'll surprise you and I think that we box ourselves in. Yeah, that's good. Well, to wrap up, what is your biggest takeaway from your time as a wedding reporter about relationships and marriage? Okay, here's my soapbox. We can learn to be good at this. And we need to learn to be good at this. We are doing ourselves such a disservice as a society when we just say, if you meet the right person, it'll be happily ever after. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're told. And that leads to a 50% divorce rate. We don't, we put so much expectations on marriage today, right? Person has to be our sous chef, our um, partner in parenting, our best friend, our tennis partner. They have to be our everything. We don't live around our extended families anymore to sort of fill in these gaps. So we make our partner be our everything. And yet, we don't take a class. We don't read books. Or if we do, we have to sort of hide. Um, we just think, gosh, this should be intuitive. You know, how many people read tons of parenting blogs? When you prepare for a wedding, people give you stacks of books and magazines on how to prepare for a wedding. Nobody wants to learn or is willing to learn about how to be in a relationship um, because we think there's something shameful about that because the assumption is we should be naturally good at it and we're not. It's so complicated. It's so difficult. We need to learn from each other. We need to be open with each other. We need to rely on each other and we need to be willing to learn because you can learn and you can acquire the skills and tools to give yourself the best possible chance of success. It's really good advice. And I think it's true because I think as I've worked with a lot of couples, they put about as much time into their marriage as they do their health. And they think eh, as long as there's not too much issues, too many problems, I'm okay. But what happens is that it just slowly starts to build on itself and uh, they find themselves in, in a, pl a place where the pain threshold goes up high enough where they go, oh, man, now I need to get help. And that generally at that place it's hard to reverse some of the wounding and the and the and just bitterness, resentment, discouragement. Um, not that you can't, but it's a lot harder than making sure that you're making that regular investment. So, really right. good advice. And I, I would just say, um, we are interviewing on the topic of the real thing, which I love the title of this because it's it's <laughs> stories of couples who have overcome the challenges and have shared their journey. And I think there's nothing better than being able to tap into the collective wisdom of people who have journeyed ahead of us. And uh, thank you for capturing all this. This is really cool. Thank and if, you. 